Lord, you have this space. We're listening. We're listening. So, God, we're listening. What a privilege to come to a community where we're not anticipating the preacher. We're not anticipating the choir, but we're anticipating Jesus. We're anticipating the power of his Holy Spirit. Oh, what a great privilege that we don't have to be like the world. We don't have to be like common people, but we're the children of the most high God. And we get to commune with the sovereignty of God by the power of his Holy Spirit. Isn't that a, just a wonderful thing? That we don't have to be afraid of life because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, glory to his name. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Careview. Good morning, Careview Nation. Our worship objective this morning is to gain a better grasp of the nature and impact of purpose upon the human life. And our call to worship this morning is from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Oh, I love it so much. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Oh, glory to God. Our scripture lesson this morning is from Psalm 139, verses 13 through 17. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Yes intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. When as yet there was none of them, how precious to me are your thoughts. Oh God, how vast is the sum of them. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Hallelujah. Even when we were dead in our jacked up transgressions, it is by grace yes. you have been saved. Hallelujah. And God raised us up with Christ Hallelujah. and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Oh, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, hallelujah, which God planned in, in advance. He prepared it in advance for us to do. Hallelujah. Can we just thank him for his word this morning? Thank him that his word is true. Thank him that his word is true for you. His word is true for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we thank you this morning. Thank you that your word is alive. Thank you that your word is active. And it's breaking asunder everything that's not like you. Thank you that your word exposes all the lies of the enemy, all the lies we've been told all week about how worthy or unworthy we were. But thank you, oh God, today that your word has told us that we are raised with Christ. Hallelujah. So we're resurrected from our brokenness. Hallelujah. We're resurrected from all the lies of the enemy that try to keep us down. Because we are your children. We are the children of the Most High God. So we thank you this morning that you have a plan and a purpose for each one of us. You see us. You feel us, God. You're intimately acquainted with all of our needs. And so we say thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying for our sins that we could be redeemed, God. We could be brought back to be all that you called us to be. Hallelujah. So we celebrate this morning, oh God, that we get to sit at your feet another time to hear the word of God. Bless the man of God this morning. Anoint him, oh God. Anoint him, God. We need rhema from heaven. Change us. Make us new, God, that we would go into the world rested believers who are resting in the sovereignty of God, trusting you, oh God, to lead us and guide us into all truth. So we give you this time, God. We say, have your way, Holy Spirit. Move mightily, break yokes, heal us, oh God. Do the miraculous in our midst, we pray. In Jesus' name, Listen amen. I am fearfully, wonderfully, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully, wonderfully, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully, wonderfully, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully, wonderfully. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully, hey, wonderfully. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully, wonderfully. I am fearfully and Wonderfully made, I am fearfully. Hey, wonderfully, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully. Do you believe it this morning? Wonderfully, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderfully made. Hey. I want you to bask in God's grace. I am fearfully. Wonderfully. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully. Wonderfully. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Out of the depths of the earth he formed you by his spirit. Hey, I am fearfully, wonderfully. I am fearfully and Wonderfully made, I am fearfully, wonderfully, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Celebrate his creation. I am fearfully, wonderfully, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully, wonderfully, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderfully made. Wonderfully made. He saw my unformed substance. 
wonderfully made. Wonderfully made. I'm a sinner saved by grace, but I am wonderfully made. He saved me yeah. and he raised me wonderfully. Wonderfully made. Oh, wonderfully made. Wonderfully made. Yeah. He's able. 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 How many of y'all out there know that he's able? Hallelujah. How many of y'all out there know that you're fearfully and wonderfully made? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Y'all can clap your hands. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all, all you could ask or think, according to the power that worketh in you, and you. is able to do just what he said he would do he's gonna fulfill every promise to you don't give up on God cause he won't give up on you he's able oh hallelujah hallelujah somebody gonna get that in their spirit today I'm going to sing it again. He's able. Yeah. I'm going to do the verse again. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all, all I could ask or think according to the power that had worked in you, in you, God is able to do just what he said he would do. He's going to fulfill every promise to you. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. He's able. Yeah. He's able. Oh, we need to get that chant going this morning. Somebody need to believe it. Here's your part, he's able. He's able. Oh, I need to hear some more y'all. I don't hear, it's not a hundred percent yet. Sing it again. He's able. He's able. Almost, almost. Somebody need to shout it like they believe it this morning. Right here. He's able. Oh, that was better. That was better. We're going to do it one more time, then we're going to sing the verse. Here we go. He's able. Yeah, yeah. I like that. And we all going to sing God is able to do. Here we go. God. God is able to do. What he said he would do. He's gonna fulfill, He's gonna fulfill every, every promise, to, promise you. to you. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Cause he won't, Cause he won't give up on you. Hey. He's able. Oh, y'all got it. Y'all got it.
got it. Yeah. Right here again. He's able. He's able. I want to sing that verse one more time. God is able to do. Here we go. God. God's able to do. Hey, come on, y'all. what he said he would do. He's going to fulfill. He's going to fulfill. Every, every promise, promise to you. To you. Don't Trying to let it go. I'm trying to let it go. But why? He's able. He's able. I want to do that verse just one more time. One more time. God is able to do. Sing, y'all. God's able to do just what he said he would do. He's gonna fulfill. He's gonna fulfill every, every promise, to you. promise to you. Don't up on God, Don't give up on God. He won't. He won't hey, give up hey, on you. why? He's, He's able. Yay. Yeah. Why? He's able. Hey, hey, why? He's, He's able. able. Hey. He's able. Hey. Hey. Listen to this. Oh. He's able. You say it. Whatever he says, he's, he's going to do. He's able. Whatever he says, he's, he's going to do. He's able. I tried to. He's able. Anybody tried he's to. Able. Anybody hey. tried he's to. Able. He's, able. he's able. He's not a man he's able. that he should lie. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. I'm glad about he's it. Able. I'm glad about he's it. Able. I'm glad about it. I'm glad about he's it. Able. Yes, he is. He's able. I'm glad about he's it. Able. I'm hey. glad about he's it. Able. I'm glad about he's it. Able. Yes, he is. He's able. I'm glad about he's it. Able. He's able. He's able. I'm glad about he's it. Able. He's able. He's able. Whatever he says. He's able. Whatever he says. He's able. You can stop right there. He's able. I can stop right there. He's able. Whatever he says. He's able. Whatever he says. He's able. Whatever he says, he's able. He's gonna do. He's able. 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 So listen. Listen. Don't give up on God. I know it gets tough. I know it gets tough. Don't give up on God. It ain't time for you to throw in the towel. Wherever that towel is, as one person said, when they throw it in, you throw it right back. Don't give up on God. Can y'all sing that with me? Don't. Don't give up on God. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to look at your neighbor. 
and tell them, don't give up on God. I need you to look them in their face at a safe distance and tell them, don't give up on God. Now turn to your other neighbor. Look them in their face and say, don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, listen, listen. This is what I want you to tell your neighbor. Don't give up on me. Don't give up on me. Don't give up on me. Because I believe in God. Hallelujah. Sing to your neighbor. Don't give up on me. Don't, Don't give up on me. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Because he won't. Because he won't give up on you. Y'all know why, right? Sing it. He's able. He's, He's able. able. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He won't give up on you. Why? He's able. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's look to him. Father God, we thank you so very much that you've been so faithful to us down through the years. We've been taught you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves yeah. even when we didn't know who we were when we've been reeling and reacting to life you have remained the constant of our lives and far be it from us to fail to worship you to give you all the praise and the glory and honor that is due your name we worship you and Lord we say hallelujah together hallelujah we give you the praise, the highest praise, because you're so worthy of it. So we thank you for this great salvation. We thank you for the opportunity to worship, the opportunity to gather, albeit safely. We thank you, Lord, for our remote contingency who has gathered to worship with us, and sing out loud in their homes, to hear the word transform us and reshape us. And Lord, we ask by your spirit that you would emblazon upon our consciousness that you're able. No matter what. No matter how dark it seems, no matter how hopeless it seems, you are able. We confess the sin of our hopelessness. We confess the sin of our despair. God, we confess our humanity of fatigue. We're tired, worn out. We've run out strength in our own and we thank you that you have Jesus commended our little bit of strength as you did the church of Philadelphia and so we thank you so much for your goodness and grace towards us we take our eyes off of ourselves God today right now in this moment of worship as we consider the circumstances that are difficult in our lives, we hereby take our eyes off of it. We take our eyes off of it. We've been staring at it a long time. We've been trying to figure it out, trying to fix it, and we're exhausted. And so God, we cast our eyes to you. As the word of God says, we look to the hills. From whence cometh our help, our strength, and our help comes from you who made heaven and earth. God, as one translation says, today, we want to see striving. We will see striving. 
and be still. We will see striving. I will see striving and be still. Be still, O oh my soul. Be still, O oh my soul. I will see striving. And be still. I will see striving. And be still. Be still, O oh my soul. Be still, O oh my soul. covenant to be still and allow you to move. We invite you, Holy Spirit, come into this place, into our lives. As we contemplate your power, your promptings, and your move, forgive us for our nervous energy, our being hyperkinetic our attention deficit disorder, our attention hyperactive deficits. So we lay down our burdens, our troubles, our difficulties in this place at this time because you're able. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say. Let's give God praise in this place. Can we just give him praise? God is good. Amen, 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 amen. It's good to see you this morning. Good to see you this morning. I just want to uh, read a couple of uh, acknowledgments. A kind word, a thoughtful deed, a caring heart, simple reflections of the kingdom of God. To our Careview family, thank you for your sympathy and gifts and prayers. We are beyond grateful for all the support you have shown us throughout this time of grief, your kindness and thoughts will not be forgotten. The Bible says in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. In care of you, you are a wonderful reflection of God's heart. Thanks so much. The Johnson and Austin family, as uh, the Johnson family lost their matriarch, their grandmother, uh, and mother uh, last month. So we thank God for that family. And um, uh, we regret to inform you of the passing of Joseph Harmon II, which occurred on Sunday, December 25th, 2022. The viewing will be held Tuesday, January 17th, 2023 at Francis Funeral Home, 5201 Whitby Avenue in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The viewing will be from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. The service be at 11 a.m. Uh, the intermit will be at Marion Memorial Park in Valley Kenwood, PA afterwards. Sorrowful, sorrowfully yours, the family, that is the father, Joseph Harmon II, uh, is the father of Linda Emery. Linda Emery has lost her father in a kind of troubling way. Uh, and so I want you to uh, pray for Linda Emery. Uh, she has uh, lost two parents in the space of one year. And so uh, that is a rite of passage when you lose your uh, parents. Uh, but I want you to know when you lose your parents, you're not an orphan. Amen. Amen. You're not an orphan. Amen. Because God is your father. Amen. The Bi uh, Bible uh, indicates to us over and over again, if not directly, biblically, and in the teachings that he is a father to the fatherless. Amen. Anybody a witness that he's a father to the fatherless? When your earthly father failed, he stepped in, didn't he? In fact, he didn't have to step in because he was already there. When men step out, God is still there. And uh, you know he's a mother to the motherless? 
One of the names of God is El Shaddai. El Shaddai can be translated. It's translated Almighty, which feels like a transliteration, a kind of explanation of the word El Shaddai. The one of, wonderful thing about language is that it's so progressive and it's always shifting and changing. It's dynamic. And uh, there are things in Hebrew that we don't fully understand or Greek in the New Testament, Hebrew in the Old Testament, Aramaic throughout. Jesus spoke mostly Aramaic on earth when he was talking to his people. And this word Shaddai can be translated the big-breasted one. And um, that means the, the idea of a mother engorged, ready to feed and nurture. That God is engorged with blessings and nutrients to bless us and to nurture and comfort us. And so I will be officiating that uh, 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 home going uh, at uh, Francis Funeral Home, 5201 Whitby Avenue. I think I got a word. I think I got a word for uh, Linda and her family and friends. I feel convicted uh, to, uh, I was unable to uh, conduct the home going of her mother last summer, but uh, I feel compelled uh, to come alongside uh, this woman of God at this time of her bereavement. I want you to join me if you can. I know it's during the work day on Tuesday, January 17th, if you can stop through. Uh, it does something to you when you've lost somebody you love and you see people you love. Amen. I remember uh, when I lost my father. It's a real rite of passage when I lost my dad. He's laying out, you know. I'd seen him in the funeral parlor. And uh, worse, you know, uh, boy, you know, uh, up to that point it was the worst week of my life. It surpassed, I surpassed it later. But that was the worst week of my life. That was a terrible week, terrible week. Uh, even back, that was back in time when I never said, Something was terrible because uh, I was such a soldier. I wouldn't say terrible. I've had to learn the word terrible uh, over the years that it's okay, uh, even as Pastor James, that something can be terrible. That was a terrible week. And, uh, um, and I remember seeing my pastor, Willie Richardson, walk in and view my father. And then he, after he viewed my dad, he came and hugged me. I, I, just, I just fell apart. I just sobbed. You know, and uh, anybody knows Willie Richardson, he is not much of an emotional man. <laughs> well, actually, he's very emotional. I take that back. He's very emotional. He's not much of an emotive man. I have seen him emote very deeply, and uh, I've been very close to him over the years, so I know him very, very well. He knows I know him very well. Uh, but, uh, boy, it just tore me apart because I realized at that time that in the spaces where my father had fallen short, uh, God used this man of God to father me, to father me uh, as a spiritual father. It's so very important. And he had been so reparative of me, and I had become uh, a strong man of God under his watch. And it just blew me away. And so my tears were, were tears of worship. I, I, I didn't know how to articulate it at the time, but it was tears of worship. So when we see people that we love, uh, that cares about us, uh, and they stop through it, it can be very powerful. If for no other reason that you will be in that situation eventually. Eventually, in Care of Your Nation, we will all lose people that are dear to us. And it's so important, uh, uh, funerals and home goings, whether people that departed is saved or not, uh, are marvelous opportunities to show love to one another. Amen? Amen? I have made more gains as a pastor involved with death than any other subject. It's not even close. There's something that bonds you to the sheep uh, that you shepherd in death. Uh, there's deeper understanding because as we come uh, to grips with our mortality, uh, the gospel becomes more precious and Jesus becomes uh, more Lord somehow in our lives. So uh, I paused to comment on that uh, because I'm feeling um, uh, my shepherd's heart is kicked up as a race to Linda Emery and Ed, and that family and friends that are associated with this man. Uh, this man lived a long time, well into his 90s, so God gave him a rich and long life, uh, and he did it his way, like Frank Sinatra, from the little bit I know about him. Uh, so we thank God for his life that lasted so long, and we will celebrate uh, his life on Tuesday morning, as I feel compelled uh, to be involved with that. One of my last pre-sabbatical responsibilities 
And it's an honor to serve the Lord and serve his people. Amen? I have a word for you this morning, but, you know, what else is new? I have a word this morning, and uh, I want to talk about find rest. Find rest in your why. I want you to find rest in your why. And I want you, over the course of this message, as I share some things with you, uh, to contemplate your why. That is, why God created you and why he placed you on earth at this particular time in human history. Every single one of you has a why. Every single one of you has a why. That is, why God uh, uh, created you and placed you on this earth at this particular time in human history and your why has to do with your purpose. I want us to think about finding rest that is not something that we pedal faster or that we jog or run faster or try to catch up to. But I want you to just contemplate your why. Every one of you has a why and your why will act as a filter for your life and it'll help you to interpret life in terms of what is truly important and what is really not that important. How many know that we worry about stuff that is almost of no importance? Amen. Amen. How many know that you prioritize some things that ain't at all important to God? Amen. God is not at all important. Can I give you one? Can I give you one that you think about that God is not, uh, doesn't think important at all? You want to hear one? Money. There you go. Money. Uh, you think about money and what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. God don't think about money at all because money is a mere medium of exchange. It's not even static. It don't even stay one place. It moves all the time. Uh, money works all the time. And whether we're talking about passive income in terms of investments or active income as I go into my profession and make money, uh, money is not on the mind of God ever, ever. And if he blesses you with some windfall and if he blesses you with a blessing, uh, that's just because he's good. But it really didn't mean anything to him. Uh, it means something to you on this earth. But God, I want you to think about that. Whatever your financial goals are, please always remember in every one of your financial goals that God is not concerned with money. If your financial goal has no missional purpose, if it has nothing to do with your why, it's a waste of time and a waste of energy. There are wasted stocks and wasted investments. There are wasted professions and wasted jobs and there's wasted expenditures because they have no rhyme or reason or fit with your why of why God put you on this earth. Find rest. Rest in your why. I love Ephesians 2.10. It's a good launch pad for what I'm about to say to you for we are his workmanship. Please remember that. You are his workmanship. You are not your workmanship. And you're not the workmanship of your parents. Amen. Amen. I don't care how wonderful they were. I don't care how okay they were. I don't care how cool or gifted they were. I don't care how wealthy they were. And I don't care how inept they were in being your parents. You are his workmanship. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, hallelujah, that we should walk in them. I want to say it again. You are his workmanship. You are not your own workmanship. No matter how hard you try to work on yourself and uh, no matter how much you do devotions and read the word and pray and try to grow or study the word of God, no matter how many sermons you hear, you are always going to be his workmanship. I don't care how many children you have and I don't care if they're your babies, uh, your babies that you want to keep safe, they're his workmanship. When they make mistakes and when they rebel, they're his workmanship. If you understand that, say amen. amen. We are his workmanship. The word for workmanship is a Greek word that talks about tapestry. A tapestry, you know, uh, tapestries, you know those, uh, those uh, rugs, those Persian rugs that you sometimes have on floors. And uh, they have all those squiggly lines uh, in them, and uh, those uh, uh, rugs used to be hung on walls. Uh, they're hung on walls, and uh, uh, the person who is the creator, uh, and there's a poema, the poema, uh, or the work, the craftsmanship of the craftsman, is that he would take a loom and he would knit 
uh, those rugs together and weave them into something beautiful with elaborate designs on it. And uh, God uses and borrows the language of the day of those that were rug makers and uh, had this craftsmanship of putting together these works of art that they would put on walls. They didn't put them on floors. They put them on walls for decoration. You are his workmanship that he can put out for display for his glory. Do you get that? You've been created in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Your life right now as a follower of Christ makes you in Christ Jesus. Amen. You're not just an abstract Christian. Amen. Just whatever that means. Just I'm a Christian. No, you're a follower of Christ who is in Christ Jesus for good works. God wants to get good works out of you that impacts the world and makes it a better place. And all of the good works that God has put your hand to was prepared beforehand. That's an amazing cosmic truth. It's a cosmic truth that before God set, let, said, let there be light, he plans your good works. Your good works were on his mind before the creation of the cosmos. I want you to understand how important and vital you are to the mind and to the heart and to the plan of God. Your why is so important that he prepared beforehand the impact that you would have for his glory on the earth. And then at some point in history, no matter what the circumstances were, if you were born out of wedlock and uh, somebody considered you illegitimate, God never saw you as illegitimate. Uh, if your family was in turmoil and if you were ignored and neglected, you had passive neglect. If you were abused in some way, God took all of the fragments of your life and as a master craftsman, he wove the pain and the broken places and the generational sin. Oh, y'all hearing me here. He factored some of that in and what not to be in your life. Somebody say amen. amen. He wove all of the ingredients to your life, all of your flaws, all of your shortcomings. You, no matter even your worst parts, are his workmanship. You're his poema. You're his masterpiece that is fearfully and wonderfully made, and he's prepared your times before you were conscious. God prepared your time. Why? So you could eventually walk in what God has called you to do. What am I saying? I'm saying there's a calling on your life, and it may not have to do with a desk, a pulpit like I'm standing at, but there's a calling on your life. You, my friend, have a why. I'm going to do something I don't normally do, and I'm going to preach bio, autobiographically. I'm going to preach autobiographically. I'm a little embarrassed to do it uh, because all of my points in this message have my name in them. That's, uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it's not a vanity project, I promise you, uh, but it is for you to understand uh, who your pastor is and what the nature of his ministry is, whether he's present here in the building or whether he's not present in the building, you need to understand your pastor, and you need to understand the shepherding that God has placed your life under, because God says that I'm to watch for your soul. I'm to watch for your soul, and I want you to understand something of my why, and as I tell you about my why, I want you to think about what your why just might be. Well, I'm a third-generation pastor. It's very uh, amazing to me that I'm a third-generation pastor. That is my grandfather, who I never met, who died nine years before I was born, uh, was a pastor in South Philadelphia. And uh, my father was a pastor in South Philadelphia. And uh, when I was a baby, my father prayed a high priestly prayer over my bassinet. And he laid hands on me and prayed that I would be a man of God. That was his one thing he said. But then he said, specifically, I'm praying that he be a pastor. He prayed that I would be a man of God. He prayed that I'd be a pastor. He was overwhelmed by the raging things that were happening in the culture. Uh, Malcolm X was shot a few days before I was born. And um, he wanted me to be the man of God that I stand here being. You know, there's a, an amazing thing. My father was not a perfect man. There are no perfect men. My father failed me in many ways. He failed me. He could not keep his family together. 
and he was not always present at critical times of my development. And um, he, his absence and failure to interact with me uh, crushed expectation and excitement in my soul as a little boy because I loved my father so much and wanted him to pick me up to spend time with me on weekends. And many a weekend, I would sit on my steps on uh, South 50th Street in West Philadelphia around the corner from Paul Robeson who was in his last days, and I saw Paul, Paul Robeson constantly walking my street. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know he was Paul Robeson back then. And I'm sitting on 50th Street as a four-year-old and a five-year-old and a six-year-old. And many days, my father didn't come to pick me up, to spend time with me. And it did something in crushing some of my capacity for excitement. And so for the last couple of years, I've been uh, focusing on my inner life and learning how to be excited again. Yeah. Amen. One of the greatest therapies of my being excited uh, was on December 9th, 2018. On December 9th, 2018, my grandson was born. And, uh, and he was born while I was preaching. And I don't know if you remember, but I stopped preaching. I stopped preaching. And I flashed a picture of this baby on the screen while I was preaching in modern technology. And so he did a lot of things wrong. He's a broken man. He's a broken man. My father was a functional alcoholic as a pastor. And I kept a secret and tried to minister to him, tried to repair him. He's a broken man. But he did one thing right. He prayed for his son of a depth of love that was supernatural. Because in looking at me in a bassinet, the love of God came in him and through him to pray a supernatural prayer that would be architecture for my life, that would make care of you possible, that would make me knowing you possible. We owe all of this on some level uh, to Ralph Christopher James Sr. who prayed for me. Somebody say amen. Like that song says, my father prayed for me. Remember that? That's my testimony. And my father blessed me from as long as I can remember in looking at me. Sometimes with tears in his eyes. And he would say, you're the last of my strength. I didn't understand what that meant as a little boy. It's a very heavy thing to say to a little baby. You're the last of my strength. He said that my whole, his whole life, uh, during a, a long, the time he lived, uh, um, over the course of my own life, until he died, he said, you're the last of my strength. It was formative. He said that to me as a very little boy. Sometimes uh, I would be sitting in the front seat of the car, this is before seat belts, and uh, he would look at me as a very little child, he said, boy, you're the last of my strength, and then he would smack my thighs, and I'd start crying, you know, because uh, he had very big hands, he was a very big man, six foot five and a half, big man, and somehow I felt affirmed and confused and not fully in understanding of what he was saying, I now know what he meant. That there were dimensions of who I was that he would never be. That he could discern potential in me. The Bible says in uh, Psalm 127 that children around tables, a table can look like olive shoots. And in that time of antiquity, olives were vital. Uh, they were, you could make soap out of them. You could make uh, anointing oil out of them. You dipped your food in them. You cooked with it. It's a, uh, you could light a lamp with it. Uh, olive oil, olives were the uh, center of Hebrew life. And these olive shoots, he saw me as an olive shoot. He saw my potential and hung his greatest hopes on me as his baby boy. 
the last person to come to his family. He couldn't keep our family together. I come from a broken family. And uh, thankfully, my mother, my mother for many years, she never got a high school diploma. She didn't get a high school diploma until middle age, and we didn't know. She was ashamed of it. But she went back and finished her high school diploma, did a lot of things in middle age. But somehow, I never understood why she promoted education so much and the arts. I really don't understand, uh, couldn't understand why she did that, why I had to take piano lessons, <laughs> and why I had to uh, develop uh, study theory and music and go to settlement music school in South Philadelphia. Uh, and, and music kind of shaped me and gave me a passport into many rooms that I otherwise would not have access to as an urban boy until I encountered Jesus. I encountered Jesus personally uh, in a dorm room at Messiah College when I was 17 years old. And uh, Jesus, I don't talk very much about it, but Jesus met me in that room. The presence of the person of Jesus was in that room. He dealt with me very dramatically. I won't go into a lot of detail. Um, uh, I can just say there was a lot of light in that room as he dealt with me as a 17-year-old as to what he wanted me to do with my life. And I said something at 17, I said, I yield. I, I don't even know where that came from. I had never used the word before. But I said, I yield uh, to the presence of Jesus. And so when I talk about why, I want to define what why is in relationship to the little that I've told you about my background. If we were to define why, what I'm saying is, it's the reason, the purpose, and the cause that shapes a person into who they are and drives them to do what they do. Why is the reason, purpose, and cause, notice I said cause, that shapes a person into who they are and drives them and thrusts them forward to do what they do. You have a why. The French call it the raison d'etre. You have a raison d'etre, a reason for existence. There's a reason and purpose and cause that shapes your personality into who you're supposed to be and drives you forward to do what you do. I don't usually quote this man. He was a proclaimed atheist and German philosopher. But Friedrich Nietzsche said this. He said, he who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. This is a brilliant man. Brilliant, brilliant man. He's more than, he's, he was right more than twice a day. Brilliant man. Uh, he was the man that was made famous for saying God is dead. He said, God is dead in the 1800s. You know, um, by the way, uh, Nietzsche's dead. And uh, he said, God is dead. And that was the most famous thing he ever said. And man is in. But he said, he who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how. You can go through anything. You can make it through anything in life if you know your why. Curly, the cowpoke in City Slickers, talked to Billy Crystal. Billy Crystal talked to Jack Palance, who played this cowpoke that drove cattle across the uh, um, uh, flatlands of uh, middle America, uh, Wyoming. And uh, this grizzled man who was a grizzled veteran of being a cowboy. He said, Curly, what's the meaning of life? And all he did is just go like that. Held up his one finger, his index finger, with a glove on it. You know, what does that mean? One thing. He said, Well, 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 what is my what is my one thing? He said, That's for you to figure out. He said, All of life boils down to one thing. Curly was preaching, he didn't know. But that movie was preaching in City Slickers. When he said that to Billy Crystal, the city slicker from Los Angeles, um, one thing. One thing, that stuck with me all these years since that movie was made in the 90s. And what I want to just invite you into is what made me your pastor. Uh, there may have been ways that I've behaved that are counterintuitive, or ways I've confused you. Maybe over the years I've offended you at points. And uh, maybe you never told me that I offended you, okay? 
Maybe you did tell me that I offended you. But I want you to understand something of the kind of pastor you have and the kind of church that you are in under my leadership. And the first why of Pastor James' ministry, uh, I want to show you the whys of my ministry. Uh, the first why, the why of Pastor James' ministry is prophetic. Prophetic. God called me with Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1 says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. That sounds very much like Ralph Christopher James Sr. praying for me that I'd be a man of God and saying that I'm the last of his strength. He said, I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. That passage has haunted me for many years, for many years. I remember I was at a preaching engage engagement very, very early in my ministry. And I preached at a Pentecostal church that was meeting in a Y, a YMCA, uh, on Christian Street in South Philadelphia, uh, which is being very, has been very gentrified you know, since then. That was back when it was a hood. And uh, I preached at this church, and I had finished preaching. And as I finished preaching, going to my seat, this, this woman who had been quiet the whole service stood up out of nowhere. I think my wife was with me. And it may have been before we were married. And uh, she said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And she says, alas, uh, as she begins to speak into my life and tell me what I was supposed to do in that ministry that I'll share in a minute. And my response, when God spoke this to me in uh, about 1984, was that I, I don't know how to speak. I am too young. I said, uh, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. This really ministered to me. And then it goes on to talk about uh, the nature of the ministry. You must go to everyone I send, to you, send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you. Amen. God told me very early in ministry, and it was very tough being in a traditional Baptist church. It's very tough to hear that I was a prophet to the nations and that I should not ever be afraid to preach and that I can't water down and I can't traditionalize my approach and my preaching. I can't preach in a way that fits in the context that God put me in. But God says, I've given you a gift and an anointing that is prophetic to speak boldly and don't be afraid, don't be afraid of uh, uh, of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, even of preachers, uh, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and he touched my mouth and he said, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations. And saying to Jeremiah that he was appointed over nations, he's not talking about regional boundaries and geography. He's saying, I have appointed you over many types of people. There was not a sense of nation like the United Nations we have now. It was just peoples of varying tongues and various uh, uh, backgrounds and DNA and um, nations and kingdoms. Um, uh, God appointed Jeremiah uh, over all kinds of people, and it didn't matter what their jurisdictions were or what the powers were or who was king. I'm sending you to all kinds of people all kinds of power structures, and when you meet those power structures, and when you come in contact with those peoples, you got to uproot and tear down. And you got to destroy and overthrow and build and plant. Maybe I have been uh, uh, offensive to some people, because sometimes uh, ministry is about uprooting some stuff, some weeds that have grown that is choking the work of God. Somebody say amen. 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 There's traditions that choke the word of God. God says and has the prerogative at any given time, even if we're committed to how we've been doing it and how we've been doing church, uproot it. Uproot it right now. God gets to say, tear it down right now. But we've been doing that 10 years. Tear it down right now. That's his prerogative that churches are dynamic and ever-changing because the spirit 
uh, 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 can make us change and life is dynamic and times are dynamic and the way that we are relevant to a culture that is changing and hopeless and increasingly godless and unspecific in their spirituality is that as the people of God we're willing to uproot and we're willing to tear down everything that gets in the way of the gospel and everything that gets in the way of people attaching to the family of God. God is violent. He says, destroy everything that is not like me. I don't care how long that auxiliary has been there. Destroy it right now. Dismantle it. Amen. God gets to say whether we have a flower club or not. Amen. God gets to say who are willing workers. Somebody say amen. Destroy it right now. Overthrow it. To overthrow means there's somebody in power that doesn't want you to dismantle it. There's somebody resisting you, and there's a demon and a demonic spirit maybe even behind them, empowering their sense of power. Where people do, uh, have little fiefdoms in uh, churches. You know, I remember uh, one church, uh, I remember, I remember uh, my first pastor, uh, 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 the kitchen was like, man, uh, you could not go in the kitchen. They had rules. You can't go, what are you doing in the kitchen? You know. Because only certain people, I got to admit, they were some cooking people. The people that was in that kitchen could cook. I can't, I can't say nothing. The food was fabulous. Ooh, there were some cooking people in my first pastorate. But I broke it down. I said, anybody can go in the kitchen. Yeah, man. You know, somebody had a fiefdom. That was their thing, their thing. I remember there was a family that cleaned, if you want to call it that, the church. And it was kind of like a kickback, you know, uh, that the main family in the church Hired family members to clean, and they didn't clean, you know, because I came in as a young man. I was probably too young, but I was a young man, and I would do the white glove test, and, you know, and I could see stuff off and wrong, and I had to wait. I couldn't do it right away, but eventually I let all of them go. They were so mad at me, mad at me. I remember at one point I dismantled the trustee board. Ooh, because people was controlling money and holding on to it and stealing some. <laughs> And I dismantled the trustee board, and instead I put stewards. I didn't want to leave them with nothing. I let you have something, but you got to be a steward because built into a steward is to be faithful and that you don't own anything. A steward takes care of somebody else's stuff. Somebody say amen. It was prophetic of me. You know what I did? I overthrew the trustee ministry. Somebody say Amen. I overthrew so I overthrew choirs, sat all the choirs down. Can you, can you imagine going to a Baptist church and sitting all of the choirs down? Woo, I was very popular, wasn't I? No, I wasn't popular. I overthrew it. Well, now why do I have to uproot that which is a weed that chokes the life out of the church? Why must I tear down, God? Why are you so unceremonial saying destroy things we're doing in church? You mean I got to overthrow the leader and the thing they're doing that is blocking the move of the spirit? Why? So you can build in its place. You cannot build until you uproot and tear down and destroy and overthrow. And that means some things got to get ruffled. Some feathers got to get ruffled. I mean, somebody got to be courageous. Somebody got to stand on the word. Somebody has to be a person of conviction. Somebody has to be willing to offend some. Yes. Amen. Can you imagine a man more offensive than Jesus? Well, who are the most important people in Jewish society? Well, let's say the Sanhedrin. Let's say the Pharisees and the, uh, the uh, Sadducees. You know what he did? He said, you know what you all are? You all are a bunch of snakes. All of you are snakes. You know what you remind me of? You remind me of whited sepulchers. You like a, a tomb full of dead bones that's painted white to look righteous. Ooh, Jesus, why you talk like that? You know what you like? You like a dirty cup that's clean on the outside, but inside it's full of filth and extortion of your own agendas. Jesus is offensive. Are y'all hearing me here? Why did he uproot and tear down and destroy and overthrow? So he could build and then plant for new things to grow. I don't believe that it's a sad thing always when churches die. Sometimes churches have to die because sometimes a kernel of wheat has to fall to the ground and die for something new to come up. Somebody say to me, how many of you know that during the pandemic, some churches died and never came back and they're not coming back? Well, I spent a lot of time on that, and I got some more. The why of my 
pastoral ministry is prophetic. Look at this second. The why of Pastor James' ministry is priestly. That's my longest passage. It's priestly. I want to just tell you that all of us, one of the core tenets of the body of Christ, the core tenet of being a member of a church, if you listen to Sam, listen to Pastor. If you listen to Sam, show enough, listen to Pastor. If you listen to Sam, show enough, show enough, listen to Pastor. Amen. I want you to hear me. Every single one of you, a core tenet of church is the priesthood of all believers. All believers in Jesus Christ are our priesthood. Why? Because we're a royal priesthood, all of us. And we're a holy nation. We're a holy people. Not that we have our own geographic location. But we're a, we're a, a, we're a, 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 a holy nation. Amen. And we're a peculiar people. We're people that have been set apart. That God uh, has set us apart to be who we're called to be. And you may find that the way you are, listen, if you have never offended anybody as a believer, you're not walking in the center of God's will. You are, you're not walking in the center of God. If you're going down the path of life and you never run into the devil, it means you're going in the same direction. Somebody say amen. And so yes, there's a prophetic mandate on my life, but there's a priestly mandate along with yours, but different from you. As for me, Samuel says, one of the greatest men in all of the Bible, He's one of three men in the Bible who have significant narrative about them that nothing negative has ever said. It's worth saying that Joseph, nothing negative has ever said about Joseph, ever. All that text in Genesis, nothing from chapter 37 to chapter 50, nothing negative said about Joseph, even with his weaknesses, even with his impetuousness, even though he knew he was gifted and he was a little bit high and lifted up, you know, a little bit arrogant maybe. God never says anything negative about him because God had his hand on his life. There's nothing negative said about Daniel. Daniel is a righteous man, and a whole book is dedicated to his story and his prophecies. Nothing negative is said about Daniel, but nothing negative is said about Samuel. Samuel was a judge. Samuel was a prophet. and Samuel was a priest, all rolled into one. He was the linchpin between God and his people. And what was the summary thing that he says? As for me, far it be from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right. You know, even when I have personal difficulties with members, or usually they have it with me maybe from time to time. It's not that often. But from time to time, I still pray. I'm praying for you right now. If I haven't seen you for a while, and you watch me in live stream, I've been praying for you because the Holy Spirit places you on my radar, and I start praying for absent people or invisible people. I know you're there. I'm praying for you. Amen. You know why I pray for you? Not because I'm godly. Not because I'm a good pastor. I suppose I am, but I pray for you because God lays you on my heart. I don't want to sin against him. I don't want to be a prayerless pastor. I don't want to teach you the way that is good and right. How do I know how to teach you the way that is good and right? Because I pray for you. My pastor, my, my, my why, the why of my pastoral ministry is priestly. The why of my pastoral ministry is paternal. 1 Corinthians 4, 15 and 16, the Apostle Paul says, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, even if you had 10,000 guardians, it's remarkable to me that as a pastor, every now and then, churches are places with permeable boundaries where almost anybody can join. And so the devil wouldn't be the devil if some people join with an agenda and then start, you know, picking off some of the sheep and having them come up with them. You follow me here? Amen. So there may be some people Join this church and want to take you out for drinks and disciple you. Amen. Amen. And the nature of social media, you know, people even, you know, cheers, to, you know, on Facebook. And so um, there are always persons that are guardians that are not spiritual parents. They could even be a leader, but they really don't have a parental uh, view of the good of God's people. If you understand that, say amen. Yeah, amen. And so even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, listen, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. It's not a power trip and like I am paternalistic. I am not a paternalistic pastor and I am not a paternalistic man. I almost apologize to people when I say I'm proud of them sometimes because I don't want to sound paternalistic because I'm so fatherly. I'm a fatherly man. And I don't want to seem like I'm belittling anyone when I say I'm so proud of you. I say I'm proud of you to people that are older than me. I say I'm proud of you to colleagues sometimes. I'm proud of you in the Lord. 
and what God is doing in your life. And I want you to know that uh, I have become your father through the gospel in Christ Jesus. Uh, for many years, our oldest member, Deacon Henrietta LaRue, has said, Pastor James is my father. He says that all the time. You ask her. She says, I'm her father. It's a, I can't imagine a greater honor that the oldest member of my church calls me her father. And you want to know something? She's right. She's not just honoring me. I've fathered this woman old enough to be my mother. I fathered her in ways she's never been fathered before. And I've done that because God anointed me to do that across generations. As many as four or five generations that I've pastored, I became people's father in Christ Jesus and through the gospel. And then he says, I urge you to imitate me. Imitate my faith and imitate my integrity. Imitate my passion for the Lord. Imitate my worship. Imitate me as the man of God who's a father in the ministry. Fourthly, the why of Pastor James' ministry is probing. I'm sure you'll like this one. Proverbs 20, verse 5 says, The purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, for one who has insight draws them out. I ask a lot of questions. How many of you I've asked you tough questions? Just wave your hand. Okay, that's good. A lot of you didn't raise your hand. That's great. All right. Okay, well, one of y'all had two hands up. Yeah, I saw you. I said, you ain't got to wave it again, Deacon Levi. I saw you first time. You know what I mean? Uh, Deacon Stefan going like that. You know, like he a Pentecostal uh, elder. All right, and so listen, I ask questions. I ask questions out of humility because I know I don't know what I'm talking about and I don't know everything. I also ask a lot of questions because I know the answers are inside of you because you're God's masterpiece. And I'm trying to access what God has already been doing before I got there. And your, your heart are deep waters. Your emotions are deep waters. Your thought life is deep waters that is deep waters that in which sometimes you drown. The, notice that the Bible says that all of the thoughts and emotions of your heart are your purposes. Lord have mercy. Your why. You have a great why in the midst of your consciousness that is the ocean of your purpose. Therefore, I ask questions. I have insight that the Holy Spirit gives me, and I seek to draw them out. It's almost a fishing motif, a fishing picture. And sometimes I go deep-sea fishing, and when I go deep-sea fishing, every time I go deep-sea fishing, sometimes you see me on social media with these big fish, these big sea bass, you know. I go for sea bass and porgies and croakers, and uh, I go way out. I go out to... Um, to the Hamptons of New York, and go off the coast of the Hamptons, a place called Montauk. And uh, I go about, a, I don't know, an hour and a half sometimes off the coast uh, where you can't see no land, you know. And uh, we got radar, you know, we cheat. We use radar so we can see the fish. This ain't about all skill, amen. We go radar where we see. We preferably like to pull over a wreck, a boat that sunk. So we can just fish to our delight, you know what I'm saying? And then all of the preachers uh, pursuing pescatarian pursuits uh, go over that boat, and we choose our spot on the boat. And every now and then I tease other preachers, you in my spot, brother. You got to move out my spot. And there's a seat there that you have to sometimes sit down because the fish is so big and it's so strenuous to reel that fish in, you got a seat to be seated and put the pole in a holder to go like this and as a perfect U of your pole to bring that thing that is several yards away from the boat into the boat. It's very exhilarating and exhausting and your arms ache and it's terrible and it's exhausting and your brothers is laughing at you because a look on your face, you look like something wrong with you and uh, you pull it in and they gaff it and bring it in and then you hold it, you know, uh, so everybody can see what you did. And I'll tell you, that's like pastoring sometimes, that it's hard getting some things out of you, to ask you a probing question. Some of us are so used to living in our own head that it's an intrusion for somebody to ask us a question. It's almost disturbing for you to love me like this. It hurts, because I was comfortable being me. I may have been comfortable being carnal and in my flesh. Sometimes when you're in the flesh, there's still purposes of the deep waters of your heart. And I don't look at people's behavior or the choices that they've made lately. I don't do that. Uh, what I do, 
uh, is I make sure uh, that I look into their heart and ask them probing questions. Are y'all with me right now? It's my insight and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to ask you tough questions, not to embarrass you, but because I love you and I believe in you. And I know you have the answers, I don't, because the Spirit of God put them there. Amen? You're his craftsmanship, his workmanship, his masterpiece. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And part of being a good shepherd is to probe the why of Pastor James' ministry is probing. The why of Pastor James' ministry is pastoral. That is almost redundant, isn't it? The why of Pastor James' ministry is pastoral. And I like looking at pastoring in the Old Testament of Jeremiah 3.15. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart, God says, who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. I covenant before you today that until I die, until my dying breath, until the end of our relationship, God tells one of us to go somewhere else. I will be a shepherd after the Lord's heart. I take very seriously because you belong to him, not to me. And I want to lead you with knowledge, the knowledge of God's word. I want to lead you with understanding, not only understanding that is abstract of the scriptures or being able to exegete a text and pull meaning out of it. And it's not just expository preaching, which I seek to excel, right? But it's also understanding of you. I will adjust myself, and I will bend over backwards to understand you because you're God's masterpiece. To be a shepherd after God's heart is to lead you with knowledge and to lead you with understanding not only the, of the word of God and God's will, but an understanding of you. I want to understand you. I want to see into your life. Sometimes I understand and see some things before the appointment. And don't be scared when I summon you. Amen. Why are you so nervous when I summon you? Is it that abnormal? You know, I kind of know what it is. Pastoring is counter-cultural. There's nothing like pastor anywhere in the world. And if, if oh, I hate to say this, if a hundred leaders of churches come into a room and we were to decide only the pastors could stay, it would be a much smaller number. Might only be 20. If you understand that, say amen. In terms of those that have a pastor's heart. Not a preaching heart, not a leadership heart, not a business heart. Somebody say amen. amen. Not a civic or social consciousness heart, but a heart for the people. A shepherd lays his life down for the people and works for uh, 33 years straight without a long break. That's a pastor's heart. Somebody say amen. amen. And it's a pastor's heart also to go on sabbatical <laughs> and reflect and repair and allow the Spirit of God to pour into him or her so that he or she can come back and lead with knowledge and understanding. Does that register with you? The why of Pastor James' ministry is particular. It's particular. Particular. That is, I'm not good for everybody. One of the most painful things of my pastoral ministry is realizing I, I can't be their pastor. Or I used to be their pastor. I'm not their pastor anymore. Because people decide how to relate to me. I don't get to decide. As I stand here right now, I don't get to decide to be your pastor. Amen. Amen. I might be your reverend, but I may not be your pastor. I may not be your shepherd. The word shepherd uh, 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 Ra in the uh, Hebrew is this person that watches and cares for the sheep. Uh, poimain in the New Testament is a little deeper, and it has to do with care in particular. It emphasizes the care and the tending and the spending time with. And so somebody asked me, I, was, uh, I, was with, I, I do secular lunches sometimes with people that, that aren't, you know, on my team in the kingdom, right? Uh, but I know that God has sent me on assignment to be with some people, to sit with some people, which is refreshing, and it's also challenging in a good way. And this person asked me, who's very spiritually sensitive and likes having lunch with me, do you see yourself as above your community 
Or do you see yourself as in your community in terms of friendships and relationships? And I said to this person, oh, man, I smell like sheep. Yeah, I smell like sheep. I smell like sheep. I'm in it. You can't pastor a church any other way as far as I'm concerned. Amen, amen. You know, there's culture shock sometimes in churches where people have been in other expressions of church where nobody bothered you. Nobody asked you no questions. They left you alone. You come. Hey, how you doing? You know, and then you go home, get in your car, and that's the end of it until I see you next Sunday. That's not this kind of church. That's not this kind of church. I will not leave you to your own devices and own reconnaissance until you tell me to. If you tell me to, I'll leave you alone. Somebody say amen out of respect and honor for your wishes. Somebody say amen. I can't promise you I'll never say nothing to you again, though. Even after you fire me as your pastor, if you stick around, I'm going to say, can I talk to you for a minute? I got a question for you. Somebody say amen. It's compulsive. It's in me. Sometimes as I close my eyes, I'm not one of these people that have a hard time going to sleep. I'm sorry, ladies, some of you who might have struggled with that. Sorry, men, some of you who might struggle with that. Yeah. I go right to sleep. Before I go to sleep, I think about. Sometimes you flash on my mind. Sometimes as my eyes open, I open and I'm thinking about one of you and praying for you. Something I heard or observed. Sometimes I review. Every Sunday I have a, uh, I, I have a review. I review the film. I'm not filming you right now. But tomorrow I will review the film of this moment. What did I see? What did I feel? What did I notice? Who seemed off? Was there tension between those two people? Why was that? I go through everything. I absorb it, and I've trained myself to not get distracted while I'm preaching, but to just absorb you and carry you in my heart. And after I rest and relax, see what the eagles are doing, of course, they have a buy today because they took care of business. They took care of business. Amen. Amen. Uh, Gardner Minshew notwithstanding. Amen. They took care of business. I'm going to watch some playoff ball, but I know tomorrow is going to happen. It's going to start thinking. Sometimes panic breaks up. Oh, my gosh. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Oh, my God. Did I say that? I was in the spirit. I was in the zone, right? I start thinking about you and how to pray for you and start formulating what will be my approach into the future of how I walk with you and walk with the fellowship at large. Do you get that? Amen. That's particular. But look at this. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The gatekeeper. Yeah. Some of you deacons are gatekeepers. We have a gatekeeper's ministry. I thought about the gatekeeper's ministry for the first time when I looked at this text. The gatekeepers watch the building and watch the people and watch the property. Their security ministry. We have, um, we have persons that are armed right now as I speak. Amen. Amen. Anything go down, they have my permission to shoot. Amen. 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 Somebody, somebody get froggy in here? Amen. <laughs> They're going to drax that sclounced. I'm going to let you know right now. They're going to drax that sclounced. Amen. And you're not intended to know that. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. Anyway, <laughs> anybody get froggy? <laughs> See Key and Peel. You got to, they know to shoot. I've, I've interviewed them and probed them. You do shoot some? Yeah, we'll shoot. All right. <laughs> Just make, they, make sure they ain't care of you people. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know what we're going to do? We'll shoot them, and then we're going to share the gospel with them while 911 comes. Amen. 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 I'm talking about somebody pulled a weapon. Y'all get my point. Amen. Amen. We'll tackle first, you know. But if it's too late, you know, what are we going to do? So I'm particular, and you're particular. Listen, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice like you're listening to me. Some of you are listening deeper than others. And you're listening deeper and you're hearing the spirit of what I'm saying. Look at this. Because he calls his own sheep by name. By name means he knows them and their peculiarities, what is different about them, their physiology, the specks in their uh, wool. And he leads them out. Why do we lead them out? He leads them out because 
Uh, there's no sheep pen that can meet all the needs. Lord, have mercy. The part of my role is not to just keep you in the 77 South Union pen, but hopefully to lead you out. Preaching leads you out into the world and into the kingdom of God for God to use you outside of these four walls. Everything we do in these four walls is for outside of the four walls. Nothing we do for these four walls is for inside of the four walls. I'm leading you out in preaching and teaching and nurturing and counseling and caring. And when he has brought out all his own to feed, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him. You know why? Because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. I've had sheep follow some strangers. I've had, listen, I have had leaders in this church with titles that were strangers. That some sheep followed. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. So the gatekeeper, some of you as deacons are to open, to grant me access, and to keep an eye on the perimeter of this church. You are gatekeepers. You are sheepdogs. Amen. <laughs> to make sure that we stay together and keep your hand on the pulse and to help me shepherd. And I know my sheep and I, uh, uh, and I know them by name and I lead them out. And you know my voice. I really believe that preaching is like FM. It's frequency modulation. You ever notice that FM is always clearer than AM? It's clearer because FM is about clarity of signal. AM is amplified modulation, which is length of signal. So you can get near Harrisburg and still hear AM from Philadelphia. Somebody say amen. But if you get too far away from FM, it starts getting distorted. And you start forgetting the signal and lose the signal. And so some sheep wander so far away from the shepherd that they lose the signal. And some of you, upon meeting me for the first time, there's a frequency modulation. Oh my gosh, that's clear. He's talking about me. Oh my gosh, that's my shepherd. That's my pastor right there. I can hear he is speaking what is in my heart. That's particular. The Holy Spirit particularizes pastoral ministry so that I know where I belong and I'm starting to figure out my why through the man of God that is speaking into my life. If you understand that, say amen. I only got one more point. What have I said? I've said that Pastor James' ministry is prophetic. To uproot and tear down and destroy and overthrow. Why? So that I can build and plant into your life. The why of Pastor James' ministry is priestly because I'm never going to sin against God and failing to pray for you. I love praying for you. I love crying and weeping before the Lord for you when you hurt. I love it. I've learned to love weeping and interceding for you. I almost feel I'm an intercessor sometimes because of the clarity and the specificity in which I pray for you. Pastor, my Pastor James' pastoral ministry is paternal because I became your father through the gospel. The why of Pastor James' ministry is probing because I am in the deep waters of your life. Even if you try to keep me in the shallow end and in the kiddie pool of your life, I got to get beyond the kiddie pool. Can I tell you, amen, amen. Look at the person next to you and say, let him be on the kiddie pool. Let him be on the kiddie pool. Amen. That's just ankle length. Amen. No, that's just ankle, you know. I want to get in there with you. Let's look at some of that trauma. Let's review that tragedy. God has made us a healing church. That's why Pastor Mike Williams is associate pastor of this church. God raised him up to affect our healing. I have a sense, I have a prophetic sense that God is going to use him to heal us while I'm gone. God is going to use him to heal you. And it's born of probing and asking tough questions and facing my inner self. The why of Pastor James' ministry is pastoral because I'm a pastor after his heart, and I want to lead you with knowledge and understanding, not only of the word of God, but of you. Pastor James' ministry is particular. It's not for everybody. It's just those people that I know their name and they know my voice. Some people have never, so I've had people be in this church for decades, or decades, and never hear my voice. That's so strange. Never hear my voice. Or they once heard my voice, and then decided to change the station. I've had people change the station while they're sitting right in front of me. I've had people frown at me. People who are very close to me. I've done life with. 
just frowning. And that made sense to me. Why are you frowning at me with all these churches and other places you can go? Just leave. It's okay. I love you. We can still love each other. It's not for everybody. Amen. You see, pastoring is not just about the coming. Pastor is about the departure. And listen, this ministry passes about the comeback. I pastor people on the comeback. My heart is calibrated to love people when they're here, when they leave. When I see them somewhere else in another setting, I hug. Y'all know I'm a world-class hugger, right? Amen. And then welcome them back. No questions asked. Amen. Amen. Just like the father of the prodigal son. My son is back. Let's, fill let's, let's celebrate. Somebody say amen. You know, listen, some of the things out here in this world that can affect us, it, it's so devastating, there's no reason for rebuke when you come back. There's no more I can add to what the devil already did in beating you up. Somebody say amen. amen. I want to particularize. This is my last point. The why of Pastor James' ministry is permanent. This is a tough one. It's permanent. Why do I say permanent? Because Ezekiel 3, 8 and 9 says this, but I will make you, Paul James, as unyielding and as hardened as they are. Can I tell you, I have never met someone so stubborn that I stood down from pastoring. them. On few occasions, I've met people who are demon-possessed or severely oppressed by the enemy, and I don't stand down. And the reason why I don't stand down, the reason why I'm so strong, and I promise you my strength is yielded to the Lord Almighty, because I'm of no use to you. I, I admit to you, there have been times I've been strong in my strength. There have been times I've been strong uh, in ways maybe I didn't need to be strong. But uh, the whole time I've been yielded, but I'm learning even more. In this stage of life and ministry, the importance of being strong in the power of the Lord, and sometimes being weak in the presence of the Lord. The reason why I'm so strong and unyielding and hardened uh, is because God made me that way. God has given me a resolve for ministry that is indefatigable. I will not back down. I will not back up. Uh, I will remain the way I was when I first entered this ministry course. I remember older pastors sometimes trying to talk me out of some of my fire and fierceness. And of course I've seasoned. I'm not quite as, you know, uh, zealous in the outward sense as I used to be. But I haven't lost any zeal. I express it differently. I'm more seasoned. I have more life experience. But I'm the same man that I was as a 20-year-old preaching. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Should be a law against it maybe. But I was a 20-year-old. Preaching the word of God. And he told me all those years ago, I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Flint is something that other stones crack when they hit it. God wants me to be, it's kind of a, it's kind of like Jesus is the cornerstone. And as the cornerstone, he breaks everything else uh, that comes in contact with him. I want to be the kind of pastor that is hard in the way that I need to be, hard in my resolve to do God's bidding. And he's told me, do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, whoever them are, though they are a rebellious people. And so your rebellion, if you ever rebel, will not scare me. It will not make me back up. It's going to make me pray for you. It's going to make me hug you. It may make me rebuke you or challenge you. I'm not going to back down. I covenant to you. I will be a pastor after God's own heart to lead you with knowledge and understanding and please God. Let me tell you the essence of all of this when I'm talking about that which is prophetic and priestly. And remember the priesthood of all believers. My ministry being paternal and probing and pastoral and particularized to you specifically and permanent that I'm not backing down. The essence of Pastor James' why is this, to help each person I encounter uncover, discover, and recover their lost self so that they might be partakers in the divine nature. That is my calling. That is my why, to help each of you, every person I encounter, to uncover, discover, and recover their lost self so that they might be partakers in the divine nature. Some of you, the enemy has battled against you from childhood. 
and you are very small, the enemy has come after you to try to make you lose the sweetest part of who you are, the richest part of who you are. Don't you harden and don't you stray away from your true self. Some of us have had a hard paper route going through life. We've been under attack for how we are. Somebody say amen. Some of you have felt like oddballs and that you didn't fit in. You're strange. I love strange people. I'm the shepherd of the strange. Amen. You know why it's a good, the word for strange is xenos in the New Testament. And the Bible says that we're to be hostile. We're to show hospitality to everybody. And hospitality is not just giving you some iced tea and some fried chicken and cornbread and collard greens and potato salad. No, hospitality is loving that which I don't understand, loving that which is different. I'm intrigued by my different people. Well, God has made the cut of your jib just a little different. You're different. You think differently. Some of you who have been different, God has made you uniquely. You've been a blessing to my life and a blessing to this church. I want to help each of you that I encounter uncover, discover, and recover their lost self so that you might be partakers in the divine nature. Imagine that, that God says, I want you to be partakers in the divine nature. Yes. Ephesians 4 22 through 24 says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. That happens under the context of a pastor. And we have a pastoral team in this church. Pastor Chris has locked arms with me. We sat in a Mazda GLC in May of 1985. Actually, I think it was July of 1985. And as we were sitting in her stick shift, 1983 Mazda GLC, they don't even make it anymore. It's hatchback. God gave us a vision of international ministry that we felt uh, in awe of. We didn't understand it. We weren't fearful. We were exhilarated. We stayed up all night talking before we were married talking about this international, we're going to do some international things. We could not have seen where we are now, where this live stream goes everywhere in the world. Though we have made several trips to other nations, about to make another trip to a new nation during our sabbatical. I want to help you. She wants to help you. As she asked uh, some weeks ago, she told us to uh, remember the one thing. That's what Pastor Mike is for. That's what Pastor Stacy is for a pastor of worship and arts to help you shed your old self because your, your old self is a false self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and we want to see you made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on your new self created to be like God in true righteousness not self-righteousness true righteousness true holiness that is reflective of the blueprint that God always had in mind for you. That's why we're here. That's my why. I was reading a book. It's called Halftime by Bob Buford. And uh, it asked me, uh, it challenged me. You think about it. It shook me to my foundation. I was on a power walk at the time. I was on power walk. <laughs> and while I was exercising, I had to stop and do the assignment right then. I, I had to just stop. And, uh, and I put it on, my, I took my phone out and I put it on my phone. And uh, what it was, was my epitaph. What could be on my tombstone? And this is what I came up with. He fearlessly challenged me to be who I am because he dared to be who he was. That's in a nutshell. My epitaph, my legacy, fearlessly challenged me to be who I am because he dared. To be who he was because he wanted to help each person that he encountered uncover, discover, and recover their lost self so that they might be partakers in divinity. That is my why of why I'm here through hard times and difficulties, through leaky roofs, 
and displaced congregations meeting in the Koinonia where the fire of the Holy Ghost got a hold of us and cleansed us and reshaped us through pandemic and through tough times, through loss, through comings and goings, through old members leaving and new members coming. I promise you, I will fearlessly challenge you to be who you are because I dare to be who I am. And that's why I sing, where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads, where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads, where he leads me, I will follow. Yeah, yeah. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Let's pick it up. Where he leads me, I stand with me, will follow. Where he leads, where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads, where he leads, where he leads me, I will follow. Go with him, with him, with him, all the way. I'll go with him through the valley. I'll go with him through, through the valley. Are you willing to go through a tough time? I'll go with him through, through the valley. This is what the prayer band taught me to sing. I'll go with I'll him go with through, through, through the tough time. The I'll go with him. I'll go with him. With him. With him. All the way. All the I can way. hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior. My Savior, He is beckoning me. I can hear. I can hear. My Savior, can you hear Him? I can hear. My Savior, my Savior is calling to a lost world. With him. with him, I'll go with him. I'll go with, with him. With him, with him. I'll go. I'll, I'll go, go with, with him. him. With him, with him. All, all, all the way. Let's give God praise in this place. He's a faithful God. He's a faithful God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How we love you. Hallelujah. Hey. You know what? I love him. Yes, 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 I love him. Cause he loved me first. Cause he loved me first. Yes, I love him. 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 Cause he loved me first. Cause he loved me first. Yes, I love him. 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 
Cause he loved me first. Me I'll go with him. With him all the way.